Uh, so welcome to the 2011 Henry Kreisel Commemorative Lecture. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to welcome you to tonight's lecture and to introduce our guest speaker, Annabelle Lyon. We're here, of course, to celebrate Annabelle's talent and to hear her deliver her lecture on Imagining Ancient Women, uh, which the CLC will then publish in a short book in conjunction with the U of A Press later this year to take its place as part of the Kreisel Lecture Series. Uh, I'll come to Annabelle shortly. Uh, but first, I, wanna, I do want to say a couple words about the CLC and, and Henry Kreisel himself. Uh, as Marie alluded to, the CLC was established uh, at the University of Alberta in 2006 to become a new Western hub of the Canadian literary community. Uh, the CLC brings together researchers, authors, publishers, collectors, the reading public, all to promote Canada's written culture and to encourage and support the research of Canadian literature in both English and French in all genres, languages, and regions. Uh, it has a very strong executive board, and all those executive board meetings, many of the executive are here tonight. Uh, the focus is always on just great Canadian talent. It doesn't matter the size of the name, whether they're from Toronto or from Iqaluit or Vancouver, it doesn't matter where. We really focus on, on talent, and it's really exciting to be part of. We also have a very illustrious honorary board. Uh, in the five years of its existence, the CLC has already established itself as a significant aspect of the literary activities in this country. Henry Kreisel, for whom this lecture series is named, was born in Vienna, Austria, in 1922. In 1938, he fled the Anschluss in England, and after the outbreak of the war, he was arrested as an enemy alien and interned in Canada in 1940 an experience he wrote about uh, in the diary of an internment camp. Kreisel ended up teaching for three decades at the U of A in the Comparative Literature Program, and he went on to establish the first Canadian literature course here at the U of A. That was in 1961, 50 years ago. His influence also extended uh, to his writing. He published two novels, The Rich Man in 1947 and The Betrayal in 1964, and a collection of stories, The Almost Meeting in 1981. Henry Kreisel died in 1991, and we're honored to celebrate his legacy through the creation of this lecture series. And now we turn to Annabelle Lyon. What a treat, truly. I first met Annabelle when we were teaching together at the Banff Center for the Arts some seven or eight years ago, and it was obvious from the moment I met Annabelle, as it is to everyone who meets her, that she's deeply intelligent, but blessed with the kind of self-deprecating humility that ensures she will be embarrassed by the manner in which I'm going to sing her praises. Annabelle was born in Ontario, for which we've long ago forgiven her. She moved to British Columbia to get her BA at Simon Fraser and her MFA in Creative Writing from UBC. She also happens to be a gifted pianist, and she studied philosophy at university, not English. She published her first book, the story collection Oxygen, in 2000. Her second book, The Best Thing For You, a brilliant set of novellas, in 2004. And The Golden Mean, her triumphant novel of Aristotle and Alexander, was published in 2009. The Golden Mean was the only book published that year nominated for all three of Canada's major prizes, the Giller, the Governor General's Award, and the Rogers Writers' Trust Fiction Prize, which was the one she ended up winning. The Golden Mean has received so many accolades, it's actually a bit daunting to know where to start. But I guess the best place to start is to say that every accolade it has received has been well-deserved. We were actually just talking about it in the car over here, and Annabelle was saying, as is her humble way, there's so many great books, I feel so lucky. And I said, well, yes, it is, it is a, a great thing, but there are so many books that get attention that aren't that good, that when a really, really great book does get attention, I want to celebrate that. So that's what it's all about. Uh, it has been garnering attention not just in Canada, but around the world. It's been translated into French, both in Quebec and in France, into Spanish, into Portuguese, in Brazil and Portugal, into Croatian, Taiwanese, Turkish, Finnish, Italian, Greek, Serbian, Hebrew, Czech. Last I heard, they were going to do a translation for Papua New Guinea. Uh, the Golden Mean, seriously, is a luminously intelligent book detailing the intersection of two epic lives, that of the philosopher Aristotle and the boy man who was his student, Alexander, who would go on to become Alexander the Great. The book is a masterful blend of the philosophical and the visceral, in which human beings are thinkers and animals, tender and savage. It's full of gorgeous writing that never once flinches from the truth of what man was in Greece 2,300 years ago. Under Annabelle's hand, Aristotle is brought to life so effortlessly 
in a first-person voice that we feel as if we understand him, which is quite a feat on Annabelle's part, given that many historians have said Aristotle was the last man to have known everything there was to know in his own time. Although I believe Stephen Harper's made similar claims. <clears throat> Failing that. Uh, but through Annabelle's artistry, Aristotle is not a remote intellectual, but a man with needs, passions, jealousies. A man who wants to feel emotion, but is overruled by reason. A man for whom we care a great deal. In Alexander, we are made painfully aware of the fulcrum between the life of the mind and the life of the body, the path of the soldier and the path of the thinker. To see these two men take the paths they do at the end is inevitable, yet crushing. As I said, the golden mean is a subject of raves worldwide. Here's just a very short sampling of some of the things critics and reviewers are saying. Russell Banks wrote, The golden mean is more than a brilliant and beautifully told novel. It's also a profound exploration of moral and philosophical issues that have troubled and perplexed us since Aristotle. Hilary Mantel, the Booker Prize winning author for Wolf Hall, her historical novel, novel on Cromwell, wrote, this quietly ambitious and beautifully achieved novel, novel is one of the most convincing historical novels I have ever read. To truly feel the accomplishment of the golden mean in your bones, however, and frankly, to feel it from all of Annabelle's writing, since her earlier books are wonderful and should not be overlooked, I think you need to hear the language at work. I just want to read a short section from the golden mean, just to get us in the mood, uh, and in case Annabelle isn't reading from any of it herself, uh, I could have opened the book really at any page and plucked out a brilliant paragraph or an insightful interpretation, but I thought I'd read you a short paragraph taken from when Aristotle goes to the slave market. This is from the Golden Mean. And it's in the first person, so this is in Aristotle's voice. At a gem stall watched by a bulge-bodied mercenary hired to guard the place, I buy Pythias and Agate the size and coral color of her baby fingernail, engraved with a Heracles the size of an ant. She likes tiny things, rings and perfume bottles and trinkets she can keep in a carved sandalwood box I can hold in the palm of my hand, a gift from Hermias. A reaction against Macedonian ostentation, I suspect. Lately, the tinier the better. The slave trade is new to Pella, a small business still, catering to foreigners like me, and usually there isn't much on offer. Today, though, we're in luck. A new shipment is just in from Euboea. The slaver is genial, chatty, smelling profit, and taking his ease in anticipation of it. He tells us about the journey by ship, a rough one with much sickness but no lives lost. He's got some soldiers, Thracians, prisoners of war, good for farm work, but with a look in their eye that says they take watching. He's got three young children, brothers and sister, he says, and what hard heart would separate them. They're each eating a piece of bread, a pretty show on the slaver's part. Dirty but bright-eyed, the girl may be three, the older boy, eight or nine. What hard heart indeed, though what a soft heart would do with them is a question I'm not interested in answering today. Beautiful writing. In the end, the title of Annabelle's book, The Golden Mean, refers to one of Aristotle's cherished concepts, The Golden Mean, which Alexander himself, under Aristotle's teaching, describes as the point of balance between two extremes. Aristotle thought of it as the point of balance between excess and deficiency, but to me, the concept is beautifully animated throughout the book, through the mind-body duality Aristotle and Alexander grapple with, through the savagery and harmony of Greek civilization in 350 BC, and even through the present moment as a mean, though not always golden, between the past and the future. Of course, the golden mean is also a perfect metaphor for the quality of the book Annabelle has written, which interprets Aristotle's towering intellect while revealing him as a flawed man through language that is both elegant and coarse, depending on what is needed at the moment, and through the sheer scope of her imagination that finds amidst libraries of material the golden mean between what is necessary for us to know and not to know in order to understand Aristotle and his pupil as they shape the course of human history. Cicero once described Aristotle's prose as a river of gold. How fitting that Aristotle has found a modern day artist to bring him to life all over again, a writer whose prose is itself a river of gold for modern readers to swim in. 
please join me in welcoming Annabelle Lyon. Thank you so much, Curtis, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you to everyone at the CLC. I am tremendously honored to be here um, with you tonight. I thought that in the spirit of a bit of an epigraph to um, my talk this evening, I would read a few words from uh, Henry Kreisel himself. I, someone uh, a couple of weeks ago gave me a, a piece that he wrote, a speech called Reflections on Being Archived. And I have to say that, that everyone I've mentioned this lecture to, or, or many, many people, their faces light up and they say, oh, Henry Kreisel, I remember reading him or I remember studying with him. And I thought it might be nice to just get his voice in our heads for a minute and sort of have his spirit with us in the room. To prepare to be archived is to go on an archaeological expedition, never quite sure of what one would find, often astonished about what one does find hidden behind doors one had thought were locked with the key lost. Archives unlock the memory. Memory is ambiguous and ambivalent. We must remember even if we don't always want to remember. Archives are our collective memory, and memory, however painful, is what makes us truly human. I want to begin by telling you the story of Philoctetes. When the Greek hero Heracles was dying of poison administered by a vengeful centaur, he decided it would be less painful to be burn, burned alive and commanded his own funeral pyre to be built. No one would light the fire, though, except a warrior named Philoctetes. As thanks, Heracles gave Philoctetes his bow and quiver of arrows. Philoctetes was one of many unsuccessful suitors for the hand of Helen, and as such was called upon by Menelaus to help recover her when she was taken to Troy. Philoctetes took Heracles' bow with him on the voyage, but was bitten in the foot by a snake when he accidentally strayed onto sacred ground. The resulting abscess left him in constant pain, and its pus stank so horribly that Odysseus decided Philoctetes should be abandoned on the desert island of Lemnos, rather than torment his companions with his suffering and his smell. Ten years go by. The Greeks capture the son of Priam, the Trojan king, a seer named Helenus. Helenus foretells the Greeks will need the bow of Heracles to win the Trojan War. So Odysseus returns to Lemnos with Achilles' son, Neoptolemus. Odysseus, knowing Philoctetes won't trust him after his abandonment a decade before, wants the noble young Neoptolemus to trick the injured man into giving up the bow of Heracles. Neoptolemus almost succeeds, to the point where he's holding the bow as Philoctetes experiences yet another unbearable spasm of pain in his foot and would be unable to prevent him taking it. But Neoptolemus can't bring himself to act dishonorably. In fact, he promises to take Philoctetes home, despite the awful smell of the wound. A terrible compassion for this man has fallen upon me, Neoptolemus says, liking his own, likening his own compassion to Neoptolemus's suffering. But Heracles, now a god, appears to them, telling Philoctetes if he goes to Troy, he will be cured and the Greeks will win. Philoctetes obeys Heracles. His foot is healed and he kills many Trojans, including Paris, Helen's abductor. This is the substance of Sophocles' now virtually forgotten play, Philoctetes. Aristotle, in his rhetoric, claims that compassion is a painful emotion directed at another person's misfortune or suffering. There are three components to the Aristotelian conception of compassion. Belief that the other's suffering is serious, not trivial. Belief that the person doesn't deserve to suffer, that her suffering isn't her own fault. And belief that the person experiencing compassion is vulnerable to a similar kind of suffering. Put another way, this third element is an awareness of one's own frailty. Uh, there but for the grace of God go I recognition. We can dispute the validity of this third element. It does, after all, seem to root compassion in a kind of selfishness. But it's hard to dispute the emotional pull of imagining one's own vulnerability to suffering. Neoptolemus, in an Aristotelian account, experiences true compassion for Philoctetes, as Odysseus does not. He believes that Philoctetes' suffering is serious, 
the racking pain, the betrayal of friends, the decade of exile and loneliness. He believes Philoctetes doesn't deserve to suffer. His trespass on sacred ground was, after all, an accident. And he recognizes his own capacity to suffer pain, betrayal, loneliness. Indeed, he goes so far as to echo the language of Philoctetes' suffering, using words like terrible and befallen when describing his own emotions. Clearly, he is as vulnerable to the sudden onset of unbearable, uncontrollable, random suffering as his friend, and he knows it. And what, you are probably wondering, has all this to do with the subject of my talk this evening? Historical fiction, and in particular, historical fiction as it relates to women. In her 2001 book, Upheavals of Thought, The Intelligence of Emotions, the great American classic scholar Martha Nussbaum writes, emotions have a narrative structure. The understanding of any single emotion is incomplete unless its narrative history is grasped and studied for the light it sheds on the present response. This already suggests a central role for the arts in human self-understanding. For narrative artworks of various kinds, whether musical or visual or literary, give us information about these emotion histories that we could not easily get otherwise. This is what Proust meant when he claimed that certain truths about the human emotions can best be conveyed in verbal and textual form only by a narrative work of art. Only such a work will accurately and fully show the interrelated temporal structure of emotional thought, prominently including the heart's intermittences between recognition and denial of neediness. Later, Nussbaum continues, the narratives to which we would naturally turn for a development of compassion through the arts are narratives of tragic predicaments, prominently including classic tragic dramas themselves. For example, the story of Philoctetes, who suffers terrible suffering through no fault of his own. We can easily see that such works of art promote compassion in their audiences by inviting both empathy and the judgment of similar possibilities. In other words, narrative works, and I would claim particularly literary works, are not merely helpful, but essential to our understanding of the range of human emotions in general, and compassion in particular. What I'm going to argue is that literary fiction is uniquely poised to perform an important ethical function in our lives, namely to teach us compassion, a deep and lasting understanding of the other, and that historical fiction with its particular tradition of focusing on moral problems and injustices, offers a particularly interesting tool for performing that function. For the same reason, historical fiction also offers more pitfalls than contemporary fiction. It risks by its very nature greater didacticism, not to mention greater technical difficulties for the writer inherent in the creation of fictional prose that is hugely reliant on research. Anachronism is a constant worry for the writer of historical fiction. Or is it? Ironically, in fact, I'll argue that for true ethical understanding, in order to feel true Aristotelian compassion with long dead characters and to gain real ethical insights thereby, writers must let go of the bugaboo of anachronism and embrace the present in the past. Tools, functions, ethics, morals, irony, a dry approach to fiction, you might be thinking. Martini dry, dust dry dry as all academe. Enough to make a fiction lover shudder. Where's pleasure in all this theory, you might be wondering? Especially the particular pleasures of historical fiction, the foods, the gowns, the jewels, the manners, the delicate dance of long ago lovers who dared not express themselves freely, if at all, and whose passionate restraint made them far sexier than the easy lusts of today. In fact, I do think there's a place for these sorts of pleasures in the creation of historical fiction. No, let me correct that. Such pleasures are essential to the project of literary historical fiction, so long as they don't make the writer lose sight of the essential goal of such narratives, to inspire compassion. Let me begin by going into more detail about what I consider to be the main pitfalls of historical fiction. These are three. I'll call them easy moral outrage, forbidden love, and excessive decoration. Even otherwise admirable works of historical fiction can be subject to these flaws and can lose some of their otherwise considerable power thereby. To illustrate each of these pitfalls and how some writers of historical fiction have succeeded in avoiding them, I've chosen to give as examples not bad or formulaic works of historical fiction, 
We've all encountered too many of these, and there's nothing to be gained from criticizing an escapist bodice ripper for everything it never aspired to be. Instead, I thought I'd talk about three extremely interesting and accomplished works that successfully avoid the pitfalls of these traditional tropes. Barry Unsworth's morality play, Lawrence Hill's The Book of Negroes, and Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall. First, let's look at what I'm calling easy moral outrage. Nussbaum makes a powerful case for the anticipatory, forward-thinking power of tragic narratives, anticipating rather than rehashing moral problems. And I'll quote, it is significant that tragedies tend, on the whole, to be in advance of their surrounding cultures in recognizing the similar humanity of different groups of vulnerable humans. Thus, the highly hierarchical and misogynistic society of ancient Athens created tragedies involving subtle forms of sympathy for the sufferings of women. The slaveholding United States created Uncle Tom's Cabin. The animal exploiting society of Victorian England created Black Beauty. Tragic fictions promote extension of concern by linking the imagination powerfully to the adventures of the distant life in question. It is worth noting, though, that these so-called exploitation narratives are not strictly historical fiction. Euripides' Trojan Women, for instance, was written and first performed in 415 BCE in response to Athenian atrocities on the island of Melos that same year. Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in serial form in 1851 in response to the passage of the Second Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And Anna Sewell's Black Beauty was written between 1871 and 1877 and set presumably in the 1860s, since one of the horses remembers the 1854 charge of the Light Brigade. These works refer to their own times, not backwards. They never set out to weave together the threads of present and past to, so, to show the relevance of the past to the present. In fact, the tragic narratives of historical fiction, which I'll define very loosely as fiction set before the writer's own living memory, is almost inevitably playing a kind of moral catch-up. We take it for granted that human history is a history of moral development, moving slowly but inexorably forward toward ever greater enlightenment. We've come to understand that buying and selling human beings, denying women the vote, making people of African descent sit at the back of the bus, and forbidding military service to gays and lesbians, to name just a few of the injustices our species has perpetrated on itself over the centuries, are stupid and wrong. Of course, this progress hasn't gone unchecked and is obviously unfinished. Slavery persists. In countries like Mauritania, which didn't officially criminalize slavery until 2007, human trafficking and sexual slavery exist in our own country. The mentally challenged and mentally ill largely remain objects of disgust and contempt in contemporary society. Hard to imagine a film called Black and Blacker or Gay and Gayer, but Dumb and Dumber barely raises an eyebrow. However, if we accept that the history of human ethical progress is more or less a vector, a cautious movement from ignorance and fear to ever greater tolerance, then the first danger of historical fiction is clear. The historical novelist is more often than not setting her work at a more primitive time in our collective ethical evolution and risks igniting outrage in the reader over an issue that is no longer active or as active in our collective imagination. It's much easier to get exercised about a settled issue than an unsettled one. It's fun and easy, but not especially challenging or intellectually engaging to feel yourself on the right side of issues like misogyny, racism, classism, gay rights, and so on. The American neuroscientist Dr. Robert Burton has gone so far as to show that moral outrage is actually pleasurable, even addictive. It produces a chemical reaction in the brain on a continuum with what we experience after gambling or taking a hit of cocaine. And consider too what James Wood wrote in, an East, in a recent New Yorker review. Sometimes the soft literary citizens of liberal democracy long for prohibition. Coming up with anything to write about can be difficult when you are allowed to write about anything. A day in which the most arduous choice has been between grande and tall does not conduce to literary strenuousness. I wish I wrote that. So what's a historical novelist to do? We long to stand up and be counted on the right side of some meaty moral issue, to assert the greatness, of our heart, the greatness of our hearts and the tolerance of our souls. As the great American experimentalist Donald Barthelme succinctly put it, fiction after Joyce seems to have devoted itself to propaganda, to novels of social relationships, 
to short stories constructed mousetrap-like to supply at the finish a tiny insight typically having to do with innocence violated, or to works written as vehicles for saying no in thunder. I'm not entirely cynical about this urge to take the easy moral high road. I do think our need for that hit of easy moral, moral outrage, the pleasure in saying no in thunder, is rooted in compassion. We wish we had been there to, create, to correct the wrongs of the past. We would have known what to do. We would have spared our fellow humans some of the, those centuries of suffering that resulted from what we, with the benefit of hindsight, can recognize as obvious wrongs. Still, the historical novelist has got to find complexity in even the most apparently settled ethical issue, or risk her story being so simplistic as to be not worth telling. Let me now turn to the examples I mentioned earlier. First, Barry Unsworth's 1995 novel, Morality Play. Set in 14th century England, it tells the story of a theater troupe who decide to reenact a, murder in a, a recent murder in a small town. Seeking to entertain, they begin to uncover clues as they research for their performance, eventually revealing a conspiracy involving pedophilia and the plague. The story is narrated by Nicholas Barber, a young monk who has abandoned the church to join the troupe. Lawrence Hill's 2007 novel, The Book of Negroes, tells the life story of Aminata Diallo. Born in Bayo, West Africa in 1745, she is kidnapped by slavers at the age of 11 and sold to a plantation owner in South Carolina. Caught up in the turmoil of the American Revolution, she serves the British on the Loyalist side and eventually makes her way to Halifax, and then, astonishingly, she follows the Atlantic slave route backwards to Sierra Leone. Finally, she ends up in London working with the abolitionist cause. Finally, Hilary Mantel's 2009 novel, Wolf Hall. Set in Tudor England under the reign of Henry VIII, it tells of Thomas Cromwell, clerk to the king's chief advisor, Cardinal Wolsey, and later Wolsey's successor. Brutal, ambitious, and manipulative, Cromwell becomes the architect of the king's religious and political reforms. The opportunities to take easy moral shots in each of these novels should be clear. Unsworth writes about a small-minded, class-ridden, ignorant, superstitious, and terrified society with no clear understanding of illness, moral guilt, and the connection between them. Hill's account of the horrors of slavery, from coffle to coffin, as it were, with rape, murder, kidnapping, disease, war, and much death along the way, is harrowing in the extreme. Mantel's Crom Cromwell is a cool manipulator in a society that used and abused women in the name of religion. But each writer finds a way to deepen the complexities of his or her narrative and to find contemporary relevance in their long dead characters. Unsworth's story has parallels in the fear, superstition, and paranoia surrounding the AIDS crisis of the 1980s. Hill troubles to make his characters troublingly complex, witness the sympathetic and conflicted duty inspector, Solomon Lindo, who buys Aminata from her brutal first owner. And Mantell similarly endows her characters with astounding complexity, making them utterly vivid to the contemporary reader. Related to this idea of too easy moral problems is the second standard trope of historical fiction, the story of forbidden love. It's easy to see how these are related. Love stories, particularly stories of sexual love, are the quickest way to scooch under a reader's defenses and grab her by the emotional short hairs. We can't resist being interested in, and usually sympathizing with, young people in love. The subsequent supposedly moral complications, they're of the same sex or different color or different class or whatever, are revealed not to be complications at all, because how could true love ever really be wrong? And of course, the thrill of secrecy and taboo that such romances entail, the stolen glances, letters, touches, kisses, become that much sexier for being dangerous and forbidden. I argued that our predilection for easy moral outrage is rooted essentially in our natural urge toward compassion. We want to feel we could have helped if only we had been there back then. Similarly, our pleasure in taboo love stories can be interpreted likewise. Far from trashy self-indulgence, I think it's rooted in our very human love of love. As babies, we need it to survive. As adults, we crave it for happiness and fulfillment. And sex is interesting. Sex is fun. But as with easy moral outrage, the writer of literary historical fiction has to be very clear about the purpose of the story she's telling. Is the love story, all those rich descriptions of lace gowns and candlelight and stolen kisses, an end in itself? 
Or does it serve the larger story the author is telling, the larger purpose of the genre, to inform us about the present via the past? Again, let's look at how each of the authors I'm discussing avoids this cliché. Bluntly, they avoid it by avoiding it. None of these three novels features a love story as its spine, though each features love in many forms and manifestations. Curiously, for such densely populated works, each projects an aura of intense loneliness deriving from an intense focus on a single character, Barber Aminata Cromo. By the end of each novel, the reader is intimately acquainted with each character's mind. We've gained intense insights thereby. Not only have we become better acquainted with the world and time of those characters, but we've allowed the distance between their time and ours to shrink almost to irrelevance. Love is certainly one way of evoking what is timeless in our human souls, but these authors are canny enough to realize that there are other equally valid roots, fear, honor, pain, intellect, ambition, compassion. By balancing the easiest, and in many ways the most simplistic emotion, love, particularly erotic love, with these other more elusive and complex ones, these authors create fuller and more memorable portraits and therefore wider channels back to historical understanding. Finally, we come to the third trope of the historical novel, what I'm calling excess of decoration. Goblets and spinets and corsets, oh my. I can hear from the devoted reader of historical fiction a certain amount of impatient finger drumming. I can't have moral outrage, I can't have sexy love, and now I can't have the period stuff either. The music, the perfume, the fabric, the food, the quirky words, the idiomatic invective. What does that leave? Go on, go back to your dry ethical theories and leave me alone with my Philippa Gregory. I'm having fun here, I like gowns and goblets, zounds. Let me respond by quoting two passages. Here's the first from Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall. <clears throat> it is a spacious chamber with a high carved bed. His eye flickers over it. In the candlelight, the bed hangings are ink black. The bed is empty. Henry sits on a velvet stool. He seems to be alone, but there is a dry scent in the room, a cinnamon warmth, that makes him think that the cardinal must be in the shadows, holding the pithed orange packed with spices that he always carried when he was among oppressive people. The dead, for sure, would want to ward off the scent of the living. But what he can see across the room is not the cardinal's shadowy bulk, but a pale, drifting oval that is the face of Thomas Cranmer. This passage clearly turns historical detail to the service of the larger story. It is not description for the sake of description. Rather, it's description that enriches our understanding of the characters involved. Notice how we are forced into the body of the character to observe this scene with him right from the first sentence. His eye flickers over it. The detail of the potpourri orange is used to twist the reader's understanding of the scene. The man imagined to be holding it is dead and wants to ward off the scent of the living in a wonderfully revealing phrase. And note the tiny familiarity of that for sure, a fragment of language that is utterly familiar to the modern reader, slightly unexpected in the character's mouth, yet draws us closer to him and his understanding of the world. For sure the dead would want to ward off the smell of the living, a very specific personality indeed that can formulate this thought. The dry, dry humor, the evocation of a powerful, fastidious ghost, the shaft of insight into the dead man's mind on the part of the living man. Mantell turns that orange to good use. Here's the second passage. The palace protected from behind by a mountain faces north with a view across the shrine and the city to the plain below. It's smaller than the palace at Pella, but older and holier. All important ceremonies are held here. At the heart of the complex is a square courtyard forested with columns, then reception rooms, shrines, living rooms. The circular throne room has an inscription to Heracles in mosaic. Elsewhere, the floor is worked with stone vines and flowers so that it's like walking across meadows in bloom. Near the west wall is the outdoor theater. A tall stone wall shelters courtiers on their way from the palace to the theater, cutting them off from the public space of the city. The theater is stone and beaten earth, with platforms for the audience and an altar to Dionysus at the center of the pit. This passage of literary historical Deadwood is from my own novel, The Golden Mean. It's the paragraph I loathe most in my entire book. It's a dutiful description of setting, utterly bland and rote, offering little more than a list of archaeological remnants. 
There's no supervising personality to guide or playfully distort our understanding of place here, as there was in the cinnamon warmth of Mantel's room above. It's description for the sake of description, the details numbingly accurate, the inscription to Heracles, the beaten earth, and utterly forgettable. I've laid out everything I think historical fiction shouldn't be, but where does that leave us? How to invigorate the genre to give it the ethical significance I'm advocating without making it a dry exercise in didactic portraiture? I'd like to turn now to the process of creating a historical character and how in my own historical fiction I've had to weigh the dangers of anachronism against the virtues of hindsight. My first novel, The Golden Mean, was set in 4th century BCE Macedon and featured the seven-year relationship between the philosopher Aristotle and the teenage Alexander, who would go on to become Alexander the Great. It's written in the first person present tense instead of the more traditional third person past. Instead of beginning the novel, the rain fell in black cords, lashing his animals, his men, and his wife, Pythias. I wrote, the rain falls in black cords, lashing my animals, my men, and my wife, Pythias, who lay last night with her legs spread while I took notes on the mouth of her sex, who weeps silent tears of exhaustion now on this tenth day of our journey. Now, quite apart from being a 21st century Canadian woman of average IQ attempting to inhabit the mind of one of the great geniuses of all time, you'd probably think I was setting myself up for problems by attempting to inhabit so intimately the mind and body of a person of the opposite sex. So let me begin by listing the problems I didn't face while writing about Aristotle. I didn't believe, I don't believe, that difference of gender entails difference of intellect. I don't think through my breasts or my vagina, and I don't believe men think through their penises. The ability to grapple with the kinds of problems that engaged Aristotle, problems of logic, ethics, metaphysics, literary criticism, biology, politics, and so on, is not dictated by gender. Aristotle, interestingly, would disagree. I'm not an apologist for his misogyny by any means, but I do think it was largely culturally dictated, and at any rate is a large topic for another time. Similarly, the physical differences between my sex and his never gave me a moment's pause. As a fiction writer, I can easily imagine being able to pee standing up, being able to lift heavy objects, and being sexually aroused by nice breasts. We've all come to understand, I think, that there's a continuum between genders, a fluidity, and aggressive sexuality in a woman is as possible as passivity in a man. Imagining myself in the sexual body of a man was a matter of imaginatively placing myself elsewhere on that continuum, just as imagining myself in the sexual body of another woman would be a matter of imaginatively placing myself elsewhere on that continuum. I also have a husband to proofread for me. <laughs> the most interesting difficulty I didn't face when writing as a man was the matter of social difference. After all, male and female social roles 2,300 years ago were markedly different from what they are today. Women were considerably less than second-class citizens. They couldn't vote or own property. They were usually illiterate. They could expect to marry at the onset of menstruation and die in childbirth, usually in their teens or twenties. Middle to upper-class women in Greece at the time I was writing about wore veils, required male accompaniment whenever they left the house, and were primarily occupied, occupied with childcare and weaving. Contrast me, your average 21st century Canadian woman. I vote. I own with my husband an apartment and a car. Obviously, I can read and write. I left my father's house while still single, though well after the onset of menstruation, to go to university. I started living with my common-law husband in my 30s and have two children with him without ever having taken formal vows. I've never worn a veil, even for dress-up. It's a matter of political principle for me not to ask a man's permission for anything. I can't sew knit, crochet, embroider, darn, pity point, tat, or weave. I am prim primarily occupied with childcare, and so is my husband. It's a job we share, a job we both love, and love to get away from when work calls. I've worked as a university teacher and a writer. I've run a marathon, slowly. To an ancient Greek, I am a man. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean by that. I operate in my society with all the freedom that a man in the ancient world would have operated with in his. Virtually every door that is open to a man in my society is open to me, and if I were to find one closed, I have a wealth of tools at my disposal, cultural, political, legal, to force it open. My three-year-old son knows about menstruation. 
my six-year-old daughter, was the Incredible Hulk for Halloween. Our understanding of gender and gender roles has changed so much since ancient times that I would argue they no longer correlate. A transparency of what it is to be a woman today would fit almost perfectly over a similar transparency of what it was to be a man back then. Now, you might say that's all very well for a first world woman living on the far left coast of one of the most liberal of liberal democracies on the planet. You might also say that I'm showing more than a little naivete, that what is true in theory is not necessarily true in practice. Certainly, I can remember reading the stories of Alice Munro as a teenager and thinking, all that oppression of women by men, all that unhappy marriage and resentful child rearing, that's surely ancient history. What has that got to do with me? only to grow up to understand the truth and subtlety of her world that had eluded me as a know-it-all teenager. And I understand, too, that there's more than a little of my own personality guiding my adamant belief in the equality of women. I was a tomboy. I hated to wear skirts and dresses. My favorite toy was space Lego. I never pierced my ears or wore makeup. I was fiercely competitive academically. I liked to read Hemingway and later Cormac McCarthy. I also grew up with an elder brother with Down syndrome. I mention this because I've come to believe that, account, it, that it accounts for a lot of my own behavior in childhood and the formation of many of my political opinions, particularly with regard to gender roles and feminism. My brother needed help. He needed protection. He couldn't read very well. He needed someone to go with him when he left the house. Arguably, gender roles in my childhood were reversed. My sister and I were the strong ones, the ones encouraged to go out into the world, get educated, get jobs, learn to look after ourselves and the people around us. My brother was the weaker one, the one in need of protection, the one who was safest inside a warm, caring home. To an ancient Greek, my sister and I were the boys, and my brother was the girl. I want to stress that my brother is not defined by his frailties, and in fact has many qualities of empathy, of kindness, of gentleness, of respect, of consideration, that I frequently wish on the population at large, male and female. But I can't deny that my unusual family life as a child contributed to my particularly forceful understanding of the world and my own very entitled place in it. Aristotle himself would probably have agreed with my analogy between the lives of the mentally disabled in our own time and the lives of women in ancient times. In his History of Animals, he writes, women are more compassionate and more readily made to weep, more jealous and querulous, more fond of railing and more contentious. The female is also more subject to depression of spirits and despair than the male. She is also more shameless and false, more readily deceived, and more mindful of injury, more watchful, more idle, and on the whole, less excitable than the male. On the contrary, the male is more ready to help, and, as it has been said, more brave than the female. Mixed in with this misogyny, I think, are some grains of truth. More compassionate, more subject to depression, more readily deceived, more watchful. Aristotle makes these observations as a biologist rather than a psychologist, but I'd hazard a guess that anyone who's generally mocked and oppressed, women back then, the mentally handicapped today, might well exhibit these characteristics. I want to read you now a scene from The Golden Mean. The female characters in this novel, as you'll have guessed by now, are few and minor. This is a male novel featuring male concerns and pursuits, because that is the world, frankly, I feel comfortable in. The scene features Aristotle giving Alexander a lesson on Homer at a place called Mieza, which is interrupted by the arrival of Alexander's mother, Olympias, Queen of Macedon, from the capital of Pella. I've read this already, Alexander says. We're in Mieza in the kitchen, seated bes beside each other in front of the hearth. Not where I'd prefer to be sharing books, but he's lately pulled something in his leg in games and has been told to sweat the muscle until he can run on it again. He sits with his heel propped on the bar where the pots hang, my Homer in his lap. I'm anxious for the book, embers, smuts, but so far he's shielding it nicely, taking care. It's sweet to see. I know you have, I say. You are Achilles, your father is Peleus. Hephaestion would be your Patroclus, yes? Who's your Odysseus? Ptolemy, he's clever. He glances automatically toward the door at the sound of bark shouts from outside. I have him alone today. His companions are out doing drills as the leaves crisp and drift from the trees in the high fall air. He's annoyed not to be with them. 
Hell, he's annoyed not to be in Thrace with his father, deposing kings, founding cities. Do I have to go through it again, he says. You've read it with Lysimachus. You haven't read it with me. He starts to say something, then stops. I wonder if Lysimachus has got his ear pressed to the door even now. Let's talk about book one, the argument, I say. Can you summarize it for me? We'll see if the prince considers this an exercise of memory or attention. Nine years into the Trojan War, he's still staring at the window. Agamemnon has been allotted a girl, Chryseis, as a battle prize. Her father, a priest of Apollo, offers a generous ransom for her return, which Agamemnon refuses. Apollo comes down like the nightfall. Here he hesitates, leaving a little space for me to admire him. Exercise of memory, then, I say nothing. And besieges the troops until Agamemnon is forced to relent. But since he must give up his own prize, he requires Achilles to hand over his girl, Briseis. Achilles, feeling the injustice of this, refuses to fight until she is returned to him. Very good, I say. And the squabbling ensues for the next 23 books. Now he looks at me. Briseis of the lovely cheeks. Do you suppose Achilles is in love with her? Or is his honor slighted? Or is he petty and pompous and rather full of himself, I say. Why not all of the above? He shifts his leg on the bar, winces. I've noticed something about you, Priam. You don't mind if I call you Priam? You remind me of him, the sad old king who doesn't fight and has to beg for his own son's shreds so he can give him a proper burial after he's been defeated. I've noticed you like to say, on the one hand, he holds out one hand, on the other, he holds out the other hand, and then what we're looking for is some conflation of the two. He brings his hands together. Don't you ever worry about being too tidy? I don't worry about it. Isn't tidiness a virtue? Woman's virtue. Soldiers, too. Tidiness is another name for discipline. Let me put it this way. Do you think the story is a comedy or a tragedy? He holds out both his hands, again, juggling them up and down. Well, it has to be one or the other, doesn't it? I say. He shrugs. You didn't enjoy it at all? Finally, he says, finally, a question where you haven't already planned the answer. I liked some of it. I liked the battles. I like Achilles. I wish I were taller. Men regress. It's a rule of nature. In Achilles' time, men were taller and stronger. Every generation shrinks back a little from greatness. We're just shadows of our ancestors. He nods. You could read it as comedy. The squabbling gods, the squabbling kings, the warriors running around, whapping each other upside the head for nine years. Nine years. The farcical showdown between Paris and Menelaus. The trope of mistaken identity when Patroclus masquerades as Achilles. These are the elements of comedy, aren't they? I laughed all the way through, he says. I know you have a sense of humor. I'm going to allude to Carolus's production of Euripides to the head, but he's looking at me so brightly and expectantly now, waiting for praise, that I falter. Such a needy little monster cub. Shall I continue to pose him riddles to make him a brighter monster, or shall I make him human? I've been working on a little treatise on literature, the literary arts. Tragedy, comedy, epic. Because I've been wondering, what's the point? What is the point of it all? Why not simply relate such history as, come, as has come down to us in a sober manner, not pretending to fill in the gaps? He hikes his leg down from the bar and massages the muscle for a moment. I've been reading something. I brought it from the palace library. Wait. He limps off to his room, I guess. Except he doesn't limp, though he must want to. He takes care to disguise the injury and walk evenly. A leader must never reveal weakness in battle, in case he demoralize his troops and encourage the enemy. Something he figured out for himself or had to be taught? Something a king would teach a king. I hope it comes from Philip. He's back, breathless. He ran on it once he was out of the room. The book he wants to show me is one I know well, one of my old masters, where he rails against the depraved influence of the arts on decent society. Only, you know, he can't mean what he says, Alexander sits again, because he uses theater to convey his arguments, doesn't he? A pretend dialogue between pretend people with a setting and so on. He needs the artifice for something, doesn't he? Exactly, that's exactly right. To get the reader's attention, it's more fun to read than a dry treatise. It is that. I think of my own early attempts at the dialogue form. I had no gift for it and gave it up. 
then too, I think you feel more when it's set up that way. You care more about the characters, about the outcomes of things. That's the point of the literary arts, surely. You can convey ideas in an accessible way and in a way that makes the reader or the viewer feel what is being told, feel what is being told, rather than just hear it. Agreed? He's mocking me, but nicely. I too have been reading a book, wondering if it might interest you. It interests me. I hand it to him. Small, he says. An afternoon's read at most. I hope it will amuse you. It's by the same author. The setting is a dinner party. Majesty, master. An attendant in the doorway looks stricken. A visitor. Go away, Alexander says. Don't tell me to go away, you miserable little brat. Olympias brushes past the attendant, who jumps away from her as though scalded. Kiss your mother. Olympias herself, all in white furs, silver stars in her hair, bringing in a fragrant cold breath of the outside. Alexander looks at her but doesn't get up. She bends to him and presses her cheek to his. Lovely warm boy. I wrote you I was coming. Don't you read my letters? Don't lie to me. I know perfectly well no one was expecting me. That attendant looked like he'd seen a ghost. Hello, sir, she adds to me. What's the lesson? Majesty, Homer, what an unexpected... Not to me, Alexander says. I've been waiting and waiting. Sweet. She helps herself to a chair and pulls it up to the hearth to make a threesome. Well, sit down, she says to me. Go on, I won't interrupt. Yes, you will, Alexander says. May I ask to what we owe this... You owe it to Her Majesty being bored out of her mind in Pella and missing her baby boy. I see little enough of him, and then that animal of a husband of mine sends him out here. Dionysus himself blew on my little pony's heels to speed my way. No, actually, I left all the servants outside. There's rather a lot of us, and then quite a bit of luggage. Her eyes drift up to the ceiling, perhaps the original of her son's mannerism. I brought food, she murmurs. I love you, Alexander says. You had better. No one else does. Do you hear from your father? You're not allowed to ask me that, remember? She rolls her eyes. He rolls his, mocking her. The whole performance is shocking. The anger, the meanness, the grotesque intimacy, their willingness to do it for an audience. Me. Run away now, mother says to son, as though reading my mind. I want a private moment with your tutor. Go get them to fix me a room for the night. He goes, taking all three books with him. We really did bring food, rabbits and cakes and things. I'll be terribly popular with the boys for an hour and a half. What a horrible place. Yes, I say. How's he doing? I think he's bored. Yes. She glances at the ceiling again. Aren't we all? You will develop the existing faculties, though, I suppose. Of course. Of course. She makes an ugly mouth, imitating me. Does everyone hate me? We're not talking about Arhideus. We're talking about my son. My son. The hell I will have to pay when I get back for coming out here without asking permission. Just for a glimpse of my baby. Into the dispatches it will go. Olympias rode a horse. Lock her up. You know they'll do that. They'll lock me in my rooms. They've done it before. Last time it was for a month because I went down to the parade ground to watch him drill. I just wanted to look at him up on that great beast of his. I wore a veil, but they knew it was me. They always know. Can't think how. Why did you come, Majesty? I needed to see him. That animal thinks he can keep me in a box. He... Mother... Alexander's in the doorway. Why don't I give you my room? I can share with Hephaestion. Olympias takes a swipe at her eyes with the hem of her cloak. I would love that. Did I tell you I brought food? Rabbits and cakes and things? She starts to cry. Do you think they'll let me stay this time? Just for one night? This time? She tried last month, Alexander says. Antipater caught up to her an hour out of Mieza. Why don't you go lie down now, mother, in case you have to write out again tonight? You'll sit with me, though, she says. Noises from outside, a warning bell, men shouting. Olympias begins to rock back and forth, hugging herself and weeping. Go, I say. I'll delay Antipater. An hour, anyway. Both of you, go. Alexander leads the way, allowing himself to limp heavily now. You're hurt, Olympias says. Oh, lean on me. He takes her arm, and they hobble out. Exit royalty. Let me stress again that I wrote this scene from a male point of view, from the outside rather than the inside. 
I can portray Olympias's emotional distress as an observer, but I have trouble imaginatively inhabiting it. To be perfectly honest, I can't imagine how every last ancient woman wasn't every last ancient woman wasn't driven by the strictures in her life to suicidal depression, and that lack of Im imagination on my part certainly colored each female character in the Golden Mean. They're not a happy bunch. Realistically, then, the life of an ancient woman is foreign to me, utterly foreign, utterly dangerously foreign for a fiction writer. It's almost beyond my imagining. I can put myself into the mind of Aristotle with much greater ease, ironically, than I can put myself into the mind of his daughter. And yet precise, that's precisely the problem I've set for myself in the book I'm currently writing. I realized very, very early on in my research into the ancient world that I had embarked on a two-book project. The Golden Mean is a male novel representing a male world, the public world of politics and warfare and intellectual ambition and the battle for influence. There are no major female characters in the novel, no conventional love story. I actually received a rejection from a foreign publisher on the grounds that the novel read as though it had been written by a man. How, I wonder, do they reject their male writers? I always knew I wanted to write a companion piece that would look at the female side of this world, the world of slaves and kitchens and hearths, the domestic world, and also, in contrast to the cool rationalism of Aristotle, the religion, superstition, and magical practices that were traditionally associated with women. After reading Aristotle's Will, a fascinating historical document, I quickly settled for my female protagonist on Aristotle's daughter, named Pythias after her dead mother. Here's an excerpt from the Will. And when the girl shall be grown up, she shall be given in marriage to Nicanor. But if anything happen to the girl, which heaven forbid, and no such thing will happen, before her marriage, or when she is married, but before there are children, Nicanor shall have full powers both with regard to the child and with regard to everything else to administer in a manner worthy both of himself and of us. Nicanor was Pythias's cousin, the daughter of Aristotle's dead sister, Aramneste. At the time of Aristotle's death, Pythias would have been about 16, Nicanor in his mid-40s. Having been a 16-year-old girl, I know the prospect of marrying a 44-year-old would be unsettling, to say the least. I also imagine that a daughter of Aristotle would have had a kind of double life. Hard to picture that she wouldn't have at least a modicum of education, might even be literate, and coming from the gene pool she does, was probably pretty bright. But being a girl, she would also have had a foot in the world of women and slaves and kitchens, the world of magic and superstition. Political circumstances at the end of Aristotle's life were conveniently, happily, for a novelist, turbulent in the extreme. Alexander died in 323 BCE in Babylon of a stomach ailment at the age of 32, leaving no clear heir. Immediately, Athenian sentiment turned against anyone or anything associated with Macedon. They saw the uncertainty and turmoil in the Macedonian leadership as an opportunity for them to get out from under Macedonian rule. Aristotle, born in the far north of Greece into the Macedonian Empire, friend to Philip and his regent Antipater, who was named executor of Aristotle's will, tutor to Alexander. Aristotle was associated with Macedonian rule at the highest level. Aristotle actually fled Athens, where he had been teaching for the previous dozen years, claiming he feared the Athenians would sin twice against philosophy, the first sin being their murder of Socrates for corrupting the Athenian youth decades before. Thus, fearing for his life, Aristotle fled to Chalcis, a Macedonian garrison town a day's walk north of Athens, where he had property inherited from his mother's family. He died there just a few months later, leaving Pythias and her younger brother orphaned. Knowing Aristotle's last best intentions for Pythias, a conventional marriage, I was curious what other options might be available for such a girl. Initially, I had planned the novel to be a chronicle of the last few months of Aristotle's life, a reckoning for him and a coming to terms for her, a gentle, subdued, autumnal project. However, once I began writing, I quickly realized that Pythias herself would have no opportunity to explore those options with her father alive, or so long as there was some other male relative around to take responsibility for her. For my imagination to really catch fire, I had to bump the old man off and take advantage of the unsettled political situation to send Pythias out into the world alone. I also worried that the character who had so obsessed me in the writing of the first novel, so long as he was alive, would risk overshadowing his young daughter. 
His voice and emotional weather felt so strong and familiar to me, whereas Pythias, little Pythias as she was in The Golden Mean, only four years old when that novel closed, remained hazy, unformed. Removing Aristotle would allow her to come into focus and speak more clearly in her own distinct voice, or so I hoped. Accordingly, I rearranged my outline and moved Aristotle's death from the beginning of Act Three to the end of Act One. The political upheaval of the time and the family's rapid evacuation to Calchas meant the other responsible men in Pythias's life were either at war or left behind in Athens. After her father's death, she was left with a household of slaves and servants to manage, a little brother to care for, a farm to run, and a living to earn. Back now to those options I had hoped to present her with. The title of Sarah Pomeroy's classic 1975 study, Goddesses, Whores, Wives, and Slaves, Women in Classical Antiquity, provides a pretty good summary. Pomeroy writes, The glory of classical Athens is a commonplace of the traditional approach to Greek history. The intellectual and artistic products of Athens were, admittedly, dazzling. But rarely has there been a wider discrepancy between the cultural rewards a society had to offer and women's participation in that culture. Did his wife Xanthippe ever hear Socrates' dialogues on beauty and truth? How many women actually read the histories of Herodotus and Thucydides? What did women do instead? Pomeroy goes on to enumerate the activities of Athenian women at all levels of society. Women of all social classes worked mainly indoors or near the house in order to guard it. They concerned themselves with the care of young children, the nursing of sick slaves, the fabrication of clothing, and the preparation of food. Wealthier women were distinguished by exercising a managerial role rather than performing all the domestic work themselves. The wife who masters the science of home economics has so greatly improved herself that Socrates pays her the ultimate compliment. He says that she displays a masculine mind. Poorer women, even citizens, went out to work, most of them pursuing occupations that were an extension of women's work in the home. Women were employed as washerwomen, as wool workers, and in other clothing industries. They also worked as vendors selling food or what they had spun or woven at home. Some women sold garlands they had braided. Women were also employed as nurses of children and midwives. In May of 2010, I went to Greece for the first time to research my Pythias novel. I was unable to go there during the writing of The Golden Mean because I was either pregnant nursing or caring for my toddlers during much of the writing of that novel, utterly captive to my female body, ironically, while writing about the world of men. I was fortunate to travel with a joint class from Carleton University and the University of Winnipeg, led by Professor Susan Downey and Pauline Ripat, with assistance from Professor Mariah Liston from the University of Waterloo and the American School in Athens, and Professor Shane Hawkins, also of Carleton University. It's important to me to mention their names because their expertise and generosity were and continue to be absolutely unparalleled. And I owe them a debt of gratitude I can't begin to repay, but by extolling their virtues as teachers, guides, and friends. I think Aristotle would have been proud to call them colleagues. I knew the main settings for the new novel, Athens and Calchas, as well as a few more specific locations that I wanted to visit, particularly Plato's Academy, shady and strewn with poppies, prompting one of my companions to wonder if Alexander suffered PTSD and Aristotle was bipolar, perhaps Plato's contentment derived from an opium habit. And Aristotle's Lyceum, hot and dry, buzzing with insects, lined with a few small aqueducts, littered with the bleached shells of dead snails. We hit the usual tourist destinations, the Parthenon, the Agora, the National Archaeological Museum, Delphi, the Temple of Poseidon at Sunion. We also visited the site of the Battle of Chironia, such a hot mess in my imagining, such a vast and eerily quiet farmland in reality. We drove past the crossroads where Oedipus killed his father. There's a gas station there now. And we got to experience angry Athenian crowds in the flesh during the violence and protests in response to the Greek financial crisis. We returned to our hotel each evening, past broken glass, burnt out buildings, and spontaneous sidewalk memorials to the dead. Through it all, I took notes and pictures, asked questions, and tried not to think about the fact that I didn't really know what I was looking for. Amidst the great marble edifices, the golden masks, the temples and tombs, and the hillsides where the ancients met to practice democracy for the first time, how was I to find one virtually anonymous 16-year-old girl? 
Images started to catch at my mind's eye. Objects in museums attracted me for being so unremarkable, so everyday, so practical, so unbeautiful. Cookware, makeup pots, images of mothers and children. An ancient potty, a child's sippy cup, complete with handle, spout, and strainer in the top for mashing fruit. Crude carvings of midwives assisting women in labor. Professor Rippat, passing behind me in the museum where I found those little straining figures, leaned down for a closer look and remarked casually that they were probably carved by women, perhaps the midwives themselves. Men didn't usually attend births. Doors in my mind started to open. In the National Archaeological Museum, I found everyday objects I'd never thought to associate with the ancient world. Lampstands, shelves, barrettes. In the Agora Museum, Professor, Professor Liston showed us bags of ancient bones recovered from abandoned wells, tiny tibiae and femurs, combinations of baby skeletons, and the puppies buried with them to accompany them to the afterlife. Midwives, she explained, probably dumped the little bodies over long periods. Some wells contained hundreds of tiny skeletons. I felt the familiar prickle. There was something there I could use. In the National Archaeological Museum, I could hardly leave a case of surgical equipment, knives and scalpels, the scalpels, ampoules, medical pots, swabs, forceps, a massive vaginal dilator. Professional, Professor Hawkins, he of the 20 dead languages, how many of your friends read Linear B, puzzled out inscriptions, recommended books, and gave me the gift of words, the ancient Greek word for fuck, an explanation of a name from Aristotle's will that had perplexed me, an appropriate nickname in Greek for a girl named Pythias. Professor Downey's hostility to the Macedonians became both a running joke on our tour and a precious source of insight. A scholar specializing in the golden age of Athens, the fifth century BCE, she grieved the loss of Athenian democracy to Macedonian empire, as I imagined an ancient Athenian might have. Nevertheless, generously, she took care at every stop to add a line or two about what happened in that place under the Macedonians, for no one's benefit but mine. I found myself looking outside the glass cases more and more to the city itself. I took endless photographs of flowers and insects. Why? An outdoor weekend market, complete with fake Rolexes, fresh fish, cheap t-shirts, beggar children, spices, pirated DVDs, and African immigrants selling plastic tomatoes to tourists. You threw the tomatoes hard at the sidewalk, where they splatted and then sucked themselves back into neat plastic tomato shapes again. Splat, 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 the rhythm of these men's days squatting on the sidewalk, looking like despair itself. These things attracted me powerfully. Large feral dogs roamed the streets, often accompanying our group for long periods, alert, friendly, herding us. The city maintained a program of spaying and inoculating them. The sidewalks were treacherous with their shit. By the end of our trip, I had notes on babies and puppies and midwives and ancient lingerie and spicy meat. I had recordings of birdsong and a camera full of perversely obscure images, ancient barbecue tongs and nail clippers and eyeliners and so on. I had only the vaguest inkling how to use. Goddesses, whores, wives, and slaves. Nervously hedging my bets, I decided I would offer Pythias not just one, but every one of these options. She would try each in turn and carry forward what she learned from each profession to the next. She would study first to be a priestess, looking for consolation in grief and private calm amidst external turbulence. I confess, too, the innate appeal of giving her a priestess's power. Joan Breton Connolly, in her book Portrait of a Priestess, Women and Ritual in Ancient Greece, describes the priestess's perquisites, honors, and authority as including at the very highest level, and I'm quoting here, freedom from taxes, the right to own property, priority of access to the Delphic Oracle, guaranteed personal safety, and a front row seat in all competitions. Moreover, she could pass these rights on to her descendants. Even lesser priestesses enjoyed a wide range of benefits that derived directly from their offices. Payment for cult services came in cash, as well as in skins and meat from animal victims, grains, fruits, cakes, bread, wine, oil, and honey. By the Hellenistic period, my Pythias's period, Priestesses received public honors that regularly included portrait statues, gold crowns, and reserved seats in the theater. A nice life if you could get it. Clearly, clear too are the possibilities for abuses, both venial and more serious. Since I didn't want the novel to be a book about religion, I decided she would become disillusioned with the priesthood and move on. Next, she would turn to practicing as a midwife. 
Here I would give her the opportunity to exploit what I imagined might have been her father's teachings. Himself the son of a physician, I imagined he might have passed some of his own medical knowledge on to her, along with his medical tools. Midwifery, as Professor Repat had pointed out, was traditionally practiced by women, and I imagined Pythias rejoicing in childbirth, as did her grandfather in the Golden Mean, as well as reveling in the opportunity to put her education to practical use. Practically a child still herself, though, I also imagined her pity and terror in the face of the many, many problems facing women in childbirth in the ancient world, and the attendant dark duties of the midwife, including the regular mercy killing of babies not expected to survive. So she would move on again. Always with the momentum of the narrative in the back of my mind, I knew I had to keep raising the stakes for Pythias, making each stab at life more desperate and more desperately necessary than the last. I imagined her farm unprofitable, her money running out, her household falling apart. She is young, educated, cultured, and she has a teenage girl's curiosity about the life of the body. We are bipolar these days about teenage female sexuality. On the one hand, we idealize it in music videos and novels featuring vampires. Sexuality means love. On the other hand, Sexual activity amongst teenage girls is seen as something dark and dangerous or soulless and empty, a necessary narrative of abuse and victimization. But as surely and as paradoxically as we link sex with love on the one hand and abuse on the other, the truth must be something more muddled, deeper and richer and infinitely more complex. I wanted Pythias' sexual life, for she'll now move on to the profession of hetaira, or courtesan, to be borrowing the metaphysical poet Henry Vaughan's phrase, a deep but dazzling darkness. Two brilliant but oddly divergent books have contributed to my understanding of this complexity. The first was Padma Viswanathan's 2008 novel, The Toss of a Lemon, a multi-generational multi story spanning many decades of 20th century India. This novel at first glance has little to do with the sex life of a teenage girl in ancient Greece. What fascinated me about this novel, though, was its utterly believable portrait of an arranged marriage. Arranged marriages are one of those conventions historical, fiction, historical fictions love to thwart. Comic heroines are forever escaping them. Tragic heroines are forever being miserably trapped by them. But Viswanathan does something much more subtle and interesting. She portrays an intelligent, sympathetic, traditional young woman who goes through with an arranged marriage and, find a comp and finds a complex life on the other side. Not comic, not tragic, but rich and complicated, where man and woman learn to care for each other after, rather than before, marriage. Arranged marriage was, of course, commonplace in ancient Greece, as it is in much of the world today. Rather than taking a first-world Westerner's black-and-white approach to the practice, this novel taught me to consider it with more maturity and subtlety for what it can offer, as well as what it takes away. In many ways, Amber Dawn's 2010 novel, Sub Rosa, could not provide more of a contrast. This fantastical novel features a teenage prostitute named Little, who gets lured into a world that is simultaneously a teenager's dream and nightmare, a world of sparkly clothes and makeovers and sweet food and doting men whose sexual appetites she must serve. She becomes a so-called glory, a prostitute of exceptional beauty and ability and solace with all the attendant status in her society. Escape becomes one of the central themes of the novel. Paradoxically, though, Dawn looks at escape through both sides of the looking glass, escape to the world of prostitution as well as escape from it. She captures the conflicted mind of the teenage girl with astute insights, as well as frankly acknowledging the complexities of teenage sexuality. An ancient Athenian would have understood the concept of a glory, Pomeroy writes that in the ancient world, prostitution was, as, was stratified just as the rest of society was. At bottom were prostitutes who were slaves. At the top were the hetaira, the companions to men. She writes, Many of these, in addition to physical beauty, had had intellectual training and possessed artistic talents, attributes that made them more entertaining companions to Athenian men at parties than their legitimate wives. It is no accident that the most famous woman in 5th century Athens was the foreign-born Aspasia, companion of Pericles, friend of Socrates. Pomeroy goes on to note that prostitutes were the only women in Athens who exercised independent control over considerable amounts of money. Power, again. 
I wanted to find a way to give Pythias power, to give her the resources to act as a man in a world of men. Was this an exercise in anachronism, or an attempt to bring her closer to me, to understand her in the only way I could? Both. It was tempting to give her the independent, wealthy, cultured life of an Aspasia and leave it at that, a happy ending of sorts, a chance to be more than just, as Pomeroy Riley remarks in her preface, one of those creatures who bleed and breed. But wars end and men come home, and I couldn't resist offering her a final act. For finally, of course, we come to marriage and motherhood. For a long time I wanted to ignore this option. How parochial, how dull, how too, too like my own life. What had I been attempting all this time, after all, if not to spare her the conventional and offer, pow offer her power, excitement, choices? It's appropriate here to revisit the sins of historical fiction I listed at the outset. Anachronism, forbidden love, excessive description. Perhaps all three of these are subsets of the greatest sin of all that a historical novelist can commit, that of escapism. As a reader, and as a writer, I confess no small, small part of my pleasure is in escaping my everyday world. A little sketch of that world. I live in New Westminster, British Columbia, a tough gray suburb in one of the rainiest cities in the world, Vancouver. The beauties of Vancouver, the mountains, the ocean, are not usually visible to me. I get up with the kids, dress them for the rain, get them to school, go to Safeway, eke out an hour or two of work, usually in a coffee shop because my husband works nights and needs to sleep, then pick the kids up and spend the rest of the day seeing to their needs until bedtime, when I try to eke out another hour or so before my brain gives up. Now don't get me wrong, it's a good life, the life I've chosen. I love my family and my city. I like rain and mist and green and gray. I've even gotten used to working in coffee shops. But without books and reading and the wider world they offer, I get short-tempered, irritable. I lose my patience and my compassion, my ability to function kindly in the world. I need not only to be able to imagine myself in a different mind and body at a different time, I need to feel my own life enriched thereby. I need to see the links between what I'm reading and my own life, otherwise the pleasure in that experience, paradoxically, becomes a sterile intellectual exercise without richness or depth. Historical fiction has to be more than just Halloween for grown-ups, putting on a costume for a night, for it to be truly satisfying and significant, an achievement of humanity rather than just an achievement of research. In other words, it's necessary to confront the probable, the real, both in my own life and in the lives of my characters. By offering my characters the escape afforded by anachronistic possibilities, such as offering Pythias nothing but power in a society where that was utterly unlikely, offering her my own experience of the world, I'm denying both the reality of her world and refusing to enrich my own by forcing myself outside my own experience. Marriage, then, and to precisely the man her father chose for her. What could be more prosaic, more disappointing, but, crucially, more probable? Most ancient women had their marriages arranged for them. Why does Pythias become less interesting if I imagine her conforming rather than rebelling? The truth is that she only becomes less interesting if I make her so. It's my job as a writer to show the richness in the mundane. So how? How? Back to my original problem in dealing with ancient women. Their lives appall me. I can't imagine their lives. I don't want to. I don't know where to begin. But of course that's wrong. Every woman knows where to begin. Marriage, childhood, childbirth, motherhood. These are touchstones, things that haven't essentially changed, give or take an epidural or two, over the millennia. Thank God for the epidural. Love, desire, pain, motherhood, the body, these endure. I could reach back to her experience of the world by drawing most intimately upon my own. My experience of touching a male body sexually for the first time. My experience of childbirth. My experience of running a household on a tight budget. My experience of the trials and consolations of marriage. These things aren't dreadfully or shamefully dull or boring, disgustingly unworthy of art. Martha Nussbaum again. If the arts in general make human vulnerability pleasing, tragic dramas, and other works describing tragic plights, encourage pleasure of the most difficult type, the pleasure of contemplating our mortality and our vulnerability to the worst disasters in life. 
The tragic spectator, as long as she plays that role in the way that the drama constructs it for her, will not be afflicted by pathological narcissism or paralyzing shame at her failure to be omnipotent. Nor, as the story of Philoctetes shows, will such a spectator be afflicted with disgust at human suffering. When Neoptolemus becomes a compassionate spectator of Philoctetes' plight, he utterly lacks the reaction of disgust that apparently caused the Greeks to leave him on the island. He has no reaction at all to the much-described foul stench of the wound, but simply views Philoctetes as a suffering friend. The ability to imagine suffering has gotten in ahead of the need to cordon oneself off from suffering. So too with the spectator. She finds herself looking unabashed at an outcast who, is, who was left alone because he was apparently intolerable to be with. And she is made fully aware that in so befriending Philoctetes, she is befriending those elements in his life that belong to her own as well. In fact, she befriends herself. Let's return to the story I told you at the outset, the story of Philoctetes. Let's imagine it a little differently. Let's pretend that Philoctetes is a woman, a girl, left alone by political turbulence and death. Let's pretend that her festering wound, the thing that makes her shameful and intolerable to the average reader of historical fiction, worthy of banishment to some remote island in our imaginations where we don't have to think about her, is her absolute normality and familiarity. She's not ugly, not beautiful, not stupid, not brilliant. She has no great artistic or scientific or technical or paranormal talent. She'll probably marry someone she neither loves nor hates, bear children, perhaps die in childbirth, perhaps survive. She is, in fact, the self the historical reader must befriend, thereby befriending those elements of the character's life that belong to her own as well, as Ms. Baum puts it. She is our modern self rediscovered in the past, the ultimate other brought home to us. Incidentally, I'm not the only writer to play with the idea of Philoctetes. A quick Wikipedia search reveals uh, plays based on the character by André Gide, Heiner Müller, and Seamus Haney, an essay by Edmund Wilson, and poetry by William Wordsworth, Yanis Ritsos, Derek Walcott, Adrian Rich, and Michael Ondaatje. Here's Ondaatje's poem, Philoctetes on the Island. Sun moves broken in the trees, drops like a paw, turns sea to red leopard. I trap sharks and drown them, stuffing gills with sand, cut them with coral till the blurred gray runs red designs, and kill to fool myself alive, to leave all pity on the staggering body, in order not to shoot an arrow up and let it hurl down through my peddling skull or neck vein, and lie heaving round the wood in my lung. That the end, that the end of thinking. Shoot either eye of bird instead and run and catch it in your hand. One day a bird went mad, flew blind along the beach, smashed into a dropping wave, out again, and plummeted, later knocked along the shore. To slow an animal, you break its foot with a stone, so two run wounded, reel in the bush, flap bodies at each other, till free of forest it gallops broken in the sand, then use a bow and pin the tongue back down its throat. With wind the rain wheels like a circus hoof, aims at my eyes, rakes out the small animals of stone moss, cleans me. Branches fall like nightmares in the dark, till sun breaks up and spreads wound fire at my feet. Then they smell me, the beautiful animals. I've quoted this entire poem because it provides a neat link to my final topic, that of language, specifically the use of contemporary language to illuminate a long-gone world. Ondaatje tells an ancient tale in rigorously modern diction. Witness the almost cubist use of language to convey Philoctetes' agony, the way the words and images are brutally, jaggedly juxtaposed. This choice gives the poem its immediacy and power. Had Ondaatje instead chosen a diction that merely mimicked that of Sophocles, say, I suspect Philoctetes' pain wouldn't have been so vivid to the reader as it is here. The reader might have admired the technical job of mimicry, without feeling viscerally Philoctetes' pain and relating it to her own body and life thereby. For similar reasons in The Golden Mean, I chose to use a lot of contemporary, borderline anachronistic language. The characters curse like 21st century Canadians, speak in sentence fragments, stammer, use sarcasm, make jokes. I didn't want to write a historical novel. Rather, I wanted to write a contemporary novel that happened to be set 2,300 years ago, 
I wanted the reader to feel as though she could be in the room with my characters, have conversations with them. I took care to sand smooth any patches of historical filigree that might have distracted the reader from the immediacy, the immediacy of the characters using dress instead of chiton, for instance, and referring to Alexander's horse, horse, mind you, not mount or charger, not as the legendary Bucephalus, but rather as the less familiar oxhead. One of the unexpected consequences of this use of modern language for me was the attendant transition to comedy. Where this expressed itself as a certain dark humor in the golden mean, I'm finding it's becoming more insidious or more profound in the new novel, informing not just the character's speech or personalities, but actually manifesting itself in the novel's theme. I want Pythias, for all her trials and tribulations, to be a comic heroine. As you'll have gathered from everything I've said so far tonight, I revere the work of Martha Nussbaum. Her influence on my life, not just my intellectual life, but my choice of career, has been profound. I began as a student of philosophy and then turned to law, but reading her work, particularly The Fragility of Goodness, Luck and Ethics in Greek Tragedy and Philosophy, and Love's Knowledge, Essays on Philosophy and Literature, persuaded me that I could pursue my intellectual interests, particularly in ethics, through fiction. I quit law school to become a fiction writer and have never looked back. However, I find myself beginning to differ with Nussbaum on one major point. You'll recall the quote I read to you earlier. If the arts in general make human vulnerability pleasing, tragic dramas and other works describing tragic plights encourage pleasure of the most difficult type, the pleasure of contemplating our mortality and our vulnerability to the worst disasters in life. Now, I don't deny that this is so, but I'm beginning to, wa to wonder if that's too narrow a conception of the possibilities of the literary arts. Could we not contemplate our mortality and our vulnerability to the worst disasters in life via comedy? I have no illusions about my own originality here. The Tempest, Don Quixote, and Barney's version, to take three examples off the very top of my head, Shakespeare, Cervantes, and Mordecai Richler are there well before me. But I do think it's worth reminding ourselves, particularly in the context of historical fiction, that comedy is an option. Too often, hamstrung by the ethical plights facing our characters, we writers respond with violence, misery, tragic misunderstanding, and mortal po-facedness. We corset our characters' speech as minutely as their bodies, in all that period-perfect, exhaustively researched underwear, and fail to notice their humanity slipping out the door. I believe it's not only desirable, but us utterly necessary to inhabit the past rather than simply portray it. And if the risk is anachronism, that's a risk that this historical novelist is willing to take. I still have worries, but writer doesn't. I worry I've still been too kind to Pythias. She's young, healthy, utterly middle class. I haven't yet built into my outline the possibility of making her a slave. Perhaps that's something I need to rethink. Nor have I really taken into account the utter squalor and stench and grubbiness of the ancient world, the bad breath and body odor and snaggle teeth and infections and deformities and chamber pots and menstrual rags and dirty food and... You get the picture. I have perhaps not yet pushed myself far enough in the direction of my own arguments that the historical novelist should must err on the side of over-familiarity, treating her characters as women you might meet in contemporary Canada rather than unreachable aliens if her work is to have the contemporary relevance and resonance essential to the best fiction. She is my Philoctetes, the creature who both repels and inspires compassion, the ancient self I can choose to befriend and enrich my own modern life thereby. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Annabelle, if you can, would you would you take a few questions? Okay, so uh, we we do have. I, I think we need to take time for a few questions. Thank you so much. That was. That was such a killing me. <laughs> oh, I've I never yeah. stood in them for that long, and now I'm lower down. That, lo that looks like a really good idea, actually. Thank I feel you. like doing that, Sorry. too. Thank you for such a, a wonderful well, like talk. Like smelly feet are a theme of the evening, hey? Philoctetes <laughs> on that story. That, that was really wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Um,
such a rich reflection on on the ancient world and on, on historical fiction and and a generous window for us into your your craft as well and uh, your your thinking and writing in process so thank you for that so please if, if you have questions uh, I, I invite you to come up to this microphone there's another microphone at the other end of, uh, of the theater You're going to have to come to the mic because I confess with the lights I actually can't see you guys very well. So if you put a hand up, I won't see you. Nothing. We need beer. <laughs> There's someone on their way Someone's here. Someone's coming. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for the talk. I really, really enjoyed it, and I appreciate you being here. Um, my question, feel free to sort of just laugh and say that's never mind, and I'll go sit down. But um, <laughs> I had an opportunity a few years ago to um, chat with Daphne Marlet, who Canadian poet lives in Vancouver. And we were talking about um, whether or not it's possible to write a female epic or a feminine epic. And one of the things that she said to me that I've really struggled with is that she felt that in order to write a feminine epic, you needed to take the violence out of it. And so in reading uh, The Golden Mean, it was sort of something that, that I kind of wondered about whether or not you might have a reaction to that um, because you're dealing with, with content that, that relates in certain ways to, to the epic. So, do you have an opinion on that at all? Or? I once punched a hole in our bathroom door. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, I, I'd love to talk to Daphne Marlatt about that, but no, I mean, I don't, I don't see that, that femininity and violence are somehow um, opposed to each other. Yeah. I, Thank you. Sorry, uh, that's, that's way too short of an answer probably to your question, but I'm, no, well, no I mean, they, they're I just, the they're same, not, yeah, they're not the apart reaction. for me, you know, yeah. quite honestly. I, yeah. And I think, You know, that, 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 that quotation from Aristotle sort of comes back to me where he said women are more prone to depression. And I wonder if that's a sort of a turning inward of certain natural impulses that we've just taught girls and women. You know, you mustn't lash out, you mustn't, you mustn't shout, you mustn't punch, you mustn't hit, you know. And if that's not a sort of a, a turning in of all of those feelings, which might have had a more natural expression otherwise. But no, I mean, I, men are violent, women are violent. I, I, I'm not sure how to give a more complex answer than that. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We still haven't fixed the door. I look at it every day to remind myself not to punch things. I'm not sure if we learn more from one or the other. I think we learn different things from, from one and the other. Um, you know, it was, it's interesting. Yesterday and today I've been reading the, uh, the Kreisel lecture that Wayne Johnson gave a couple of years ago where he talks very much about um, the role of history and fiction and how they interact or don't. And, you know, I think that I really agree with him. Anybody coming to a, a, a work of historical fiction knows that it's fiction. And so that opens you up to a certain fluidity and freedom to, to mess with actual facts, which is, you know, the facts are what you're getting from cre good creative nonfiction, I think. But what you're getting access to instead, as, as Nussbaum would say, is that sort of those emotional truths that might be harder to get from a drier text. So it's not that I think they're somehow um, mutually exclusive or something. I think that they, they do very different, they're apples and oranges, they do different things for me. And I've got someone up at the mic too. <coughs> can you hear me? I can. Okay. <laughs> I just found it interesting how you're talking about the world of English and how you can find the psychology, the sociology, the politics all in this Aryan realm, and how you're in the legal world, the world of law, and you change over into the world of English. And I wonder if you could talk more about that and how I'm finding 
my own research, you know, with Thomas Hardy and so on, how all the artists are finding way back before these psychologies and illnesses were discovered and labeled, they saw that in their characters in society and talked about it. Something like Tessa Duvalls and what she went through, which I think is like um, psychomatic stress disorder, and the things that the writer saw before the medical field really got into it and labeled it. So I thought you could talk more about that. Well, I think you've just expressed it really, really well. And in fact, you know, I would argue that Aristotle is one of those people too who first found words to describe you know, what today we call bipolar disorder. He talked in terms of hot black bile and cold black bile and, you know, used these funny words, but he just, the thing he was getting at, forget what the label was, the thing he was getting at was very recognizable to us. And I think, as you very well point out, that's another thing that fiction can do and that interaction between fiction and, and medicine can be quite interesting too. Um, fiction and, and law, it's a sort of, it's a way of getting at character in a really deep sense. And that's useful in those fields. And I think that, you know, writers, if they are anything, they're, they're people who think very much about character and they observe character. And, you know, maybe it takes the scientists to come along a hundred years later and say, yeah, that's what you were talking about, where the writer themselves may not have, you know, had the tools to sort of formally call it what it was. But I think that those tools of the observation can give us huge insight, as you point out, in many, many more areas than just ethics, which I was talking about tonight, but certainly in, in psychology and, you know, there too, in science even. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, I, if I was to claim that I was making any particular political point with the golden mean, I think it would be to encourage a recognition, particularly in the character of Alexander, I think, that, but also with, with Aristotle, I think, that, that certain mental illnesses that we think of as very contemporary and very recent are, in fact, as old as humanity, really. You know, I think that Depression is as old as humanity. Aristotle himself describes it. I think that post-traumatic stress, which you know we think has only been with us since you know the first Gulf War, in a way, or since Romeo Dallaire first was brave enough to stand up and talk about it. In fact, if we go back and look through about time, through back through human warfare, that's been with us always. And I think a recognition of of that that it's not something new. It's not something shameful, it's just a natural part of warfare, it's what it is, would perhaps lead to a greater understanding today of what um, those soldiers and their families are suffering and, you know, I would hope lead to greater resources. I, I make no claims that my book can do all of that, but again, it's that idea, I think, of, of forcing ourselves into the mind of the other and just opening up our understanding, making it, just pushing those boundaries out that little bit further. And for me, that's very much what fiction can do. So it's not, I don't mean ethics or morals in the sense of, you know, here's my book about why we should all oppose capital punishment. It's not so much specific moral issues. It's more this idea that, you know, things are not black and white. We have to be encouraged to see th the shades of gray and to, l to learn to look from the other side at problems, to learn to be open to arguments from the other side by putting ourselves into other characters. And so I'm not sure if, if a political goals or political, um, specific political sort of agendas necessarily suit fiction. I think it's a, a subtler project than that. It's a, a different project than that, what, what great fiction can do for me. Hi, Annabelle. Hi. Bright lights. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi. I'm curious about, um, you, you, speak, you speak so much about compassion. And I'm curious about, 
Chris, how you think of it, and if you think it, it, it's a, if compassion itself is, it has been a constant uh, for humanity, and if you see it as an evolving quality, something that is, when you're writing to, um, as, to serve compassion, really, if you see it as an evolving trait. What an interesting question. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I do see it. I'm not sure if I quite heard the first part of the question, but I do think that it's, you know, I would argue similarly as with those mental disorders that I was talking about. Yes, I think compassion is essential to, it is essential to what it is to be human. Um, I do believe that there's certain, that, you know, we have certain just innate ethical feelings we have. You know, we are, as we, we're, we're people, we're born to love. I mean, I think that that's at the very bottom, at the very root of who we are, and compassion ties into that, you know. Are we evolving? Is that evolving? I hope so, in tandem with, you know, those other ethical areas that I was talking about. Surely, you know, as we have learned in the white Western world, for instance, um, to become more tolerant of other races and other countries and other religions and other classes. You know, not always, you know, it's three steps forward, one step back, I think sometimes, but, you know, I hope that that's a, an expanding circle of compassion and a realization that the possibilities for love are greater than we assume. You know, we, it's your family. And then the you know the kinship group if you want to go ancient and then you know your village and then your and I think we can just keep expanding it outward and outward and we're learning to do that. I think we're learning to do that. We don't always go forward. We do go back sometimes, but yeah, for me that's that's compassion is is tied to ethics and ethical evolution for sure. Yeah, and are, which are in turn tied to love. And I think love is just at the it, it's what we are. It's what makes us human. You know, it's it's something very, very, very essential to who we are as humans. I think. Well, uh, there there will be more time for questions and book sales by Audrey's and book signings by Annabelle, and so uh, I invite you to the reception, which is waiting at, uh, for us outside. And do stick around, look at look at the books for sale, and uh, maybe say exchange a few words with with Annabelle. So uh, thank you, Annabelle Lyon. This was truly wonderful. Thank you thank so you. very much. Thanks. Again.